Good evening and welcome to this special presentation of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. I'm Lieutenant Governor Adam Gregg coming to you from the beautiful Iowa State Capitol, uh, where as you can see behind me, it's undergoing a little bit of renovation right now. I'll be your host and moderator for this evening. I'm also a member of the Hoover Presidential Foundation's Board of Directors, uh, as is our featured speaker tonight, Margaret Hoover. We're all so glad that you could join us this evening. As most of you are aware, the Foundation hosts a virtual program on the third Thursday of every month, aptly named Third Thursday at Hoover's. I'd like to encourage you to regularly check our website and our Facebook page and register for upcoming programs. We've got some great ones coming up. Next month, we celebrate Lou Henry Hoover on the third Thursday with a program called A Woman of Achievement, Stories of Life, of the life from the Life of Lou Henry Hoover, presented by author and historian Annette Dunlap. Later, on March 29th, which, by the way, is Lou's birthday, Hoover great-granddaughter Leslie Hoover Lobel and archivist Spencer Howard will present Lou Henry Hoover, a life of adventure. You're sure to see rare photos and hear stories that never made it into the history books here. Please join us by registering at hooverpresidentialfoundation.org. As for this program, we invite you to enter questions at any time during the program through the Q&A feature that you'll find along the edge of your screen. You can also vote for questions that someone else has entered if you'd like to hear that answered. So we may not have time to get to every question. I'll try to uh, ask the top vote getters. Tonight's presentation is called Behind the Scenes, Firing Lines with Margaret Hoover. It's my pleasure to welcome a familiar face to many. You may know her as the host of PBS's Firing Line with Margaret Hoover. Margaret is a CNN political commentator and has served in the White House under President George W. Bush in the Department of Homeland Security on Capitol Hill and in two presidential campaigns. She's the president of the American Unity Fund, a political organization focused on achieving full freedom and equality for LGBT Americans as well as the best-selling author of American Individualism, How a New Generation of Conservatives Can Save the Republican Party. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Daily News, the Daily Beast, CNN.com, and FoxNews.com. Ms. Hoover serves on the boards of Stanford University's Hoover Institution, the Hoover Presidential Foundation, and the Belgian American Educational Foundation. Raised in Colorado, Margaret has lived in China, Mexico, Bolivia, and Taiwan. She speaks fluent Spanish and has studied Mandarin Chinese. Margaret lives in New York City with her husband and their two children. And I suppose I should mention, she also happens to be President Hoover's great granddaughter. So with that, welcome Margaret and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you again. This is a, a reprisal in sorts of a program that we were able to um, to put together uh, for the Hoover Presidential Foundation pre-COVID. It was probably um, the last great dinner that we had before COVID, and we look forward to being able to resume and convene together um, after we're all vaccinated, maybe even as early if we're optimistic as the end of the summer and, and certainly a banquet next year in 2022. So, um, and maybe, well, who knows? I, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I'm gonna, I'll get, I'm getting text messages from Jerry already. So uh, um, thank you all very much for, for, for joining and for wanting to learn a little bit more about Firing Line. Um, you know, Firing Line, for those of you who don't know, was a program that was hosted uh, by William F. Buckley Jr. who is, I think, justly identified as the most prominent television personality of the modern American conservative movement. Uh, he uh, was, of course, the founder of National Review, which is a conservative magazine and a, a major convening force of conservative intellectuals in the uh, latter half of the 20th century in the United States. And um, was, a, was a writer, was a public intellectual, and also had quite a high degree of political savvy uh, in that he was able to bring together um, a series of thinkers who were thinking through what was a post-war, post, uh, latter half of the 20th century, uh, American uh, conservative uh, set of policies going to uh, be constituted of. And so he, he first began uh, his career really uh, and came to prominence after he had published God at Man at Yale by running for mayor in New York City in 1965. And um, he of course had actually no intention of winning the mayoralty. He in fact was asked if he was, what the first thing he would do when he was elected mayor would be. And he famously quipped, ask for a recount. 
Uh, so he was not somebody who was running to, to be a politician or to have um, a, a political life explicitly, um, but he was running to, to put forward and to promote a certain set of ideas. Um, which was in 1965 when he ran for mayor, which is just a, a year after uh, Herbert Hoover uh, had passed away. Um, and there is a really interesting story and history between Hoover and Buckley um, that actually ties into the reincarnation of Firing Line that I have uh, reconstituted, um, which I'll tell you about quickly. And, uh, and then I'd like to show you a little bit of, of the program and, and then tell you about how the program came to be and then let Adam ask me some questions about it and uh, take your questions about it. So that's how um, this presentation will go. Uh, Buckley, when he ran for mayor in 1965, was, was so good on the stump and, and so good in the debates. I mean, he made the debates for New York City mayor must-see television, which was a, a very uncommon thing for municipal uh, races to, to garner such attention and to be so entertaining on television. And it was after he lost for mayor, which was, of course, no surprise, that there was a television producer, William Stiebel, who said, you know what, this has to be a television program. And so Firing Line began in 1966 and ran for 33 years. Buckley was the longest running television host of a single program with a single host in television history. He hosted Firing Line longer than Johnny Carson hosted The Tonight Show. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a little known fact that he rarely gets credit for. Um, Buckley actually came to West Branch, Iowa. Um, he addressed the Hoover Presidential Foundation in 1988 um, on one of our banquet dinners, in fact. And at the time that he was beginning to put together uh, the support for National Review in the, in the mid-1960s, he actually visited President Hoover in his aforementioned suite in the Waldorf Astoria, the one that my dad uh, had the opportunity to tell the story about how he lived there one summer. Um, Buckley took meetings, I mean, Hoover took meetings as, a, as the elder statesman and the uh, oldest uh, living post-president, longest living post-president, took meetings with all kinds of dignitaries and diplomats and heads of state and, um, and young conservatives, as it turned out. And so Buckley had been recommended that if he wanted to start a conservative opinion journal, he should talk to Herbert Hoover. And he accounted, he actually wrote a, a wonderful essay about his encounter with Herbert Hoover. And he, Hoover was hard of hearing by this point in his life. He was um, about 88 and Hoover, Buckley explains making this pitch to Hoover that you know there, there needs to be a conservative journal uh, that can put together the ideas that you, sir, began to articulate and enunciate uh, in the time of your post-presidency after you left the White House. And of course, this is again, the beginning of the modern American conservative movement, which, which Buckley is really putting together in the 60s, but that is carrying the church forward very explicitly um, from Hoover's uh, arguments that he was making as he left the White House against FDR's New Deal. Um, and there was a, a real philosophical, I think, um, argument and, and contest of ideas around how the government and how the federal government should respond uh, to, to uh, economic calamity in the way that it did. And of course, um, historians and economists can, can look back and I think are constantly reviewing and revising um, that period of time. I think with every reiteration, I think Hoover gets a fairer look in history, but Buckley was very explicitly trying to carry forth many of the ideas and the arguments that Hoover made in his post-presidency. And they did infuse the modern American conservative movement and influenced Buckley. Um, so that when Buckley launched Firing Line in 1966, uh, while Hoover ha had been deceased now two years, um, he was aware of Firing Line, of, of National Review, of Buckley's efforts, and that there would be a new birth of, of a, a, a set of ideas that, that could directly connected to him and his post-presidency, um, which is why it's quite interesting that in 2004, after Buckley had stopped hosting Firing Line in 1999, in 2004, Buckley handed over all of the archival materials from Firing Line, that was 1,504 episodes, all of the transcripts to those episodes, research materials, some notes and letters, 
uh, and gave them to the Hoover Institution, uh, in, which is the, one of the legacy organizations that Herbert Hoover founded that's associated with Stanford University. And they and their archival repository have the whole collection of firing lines that Buckley hosted. And if you are a, a viewer of this incarnation of firing line, the one that I have the honor of hosting, you will notice that in every single episode, um, with perhaps two or three exceptions, and we are now in our third season, so we have produced more than 120 programs. Uh, our program is a once a week program, so was Buckley's, it was a once a week program. We actually have original content, original Buckley firing lines. We, we just drop it in and I use it as an, an editorial point to uh, prompt somebody to respond to a line of argument that is from Buckley's day, but enormously relevant now. And, and I think you can see that arguments over time in some cases don't change at all. Um, or in other cases, uh, people have been proved correct or wrong. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool and, and a great ode to Buckley, mostly out of um, my, my reverence and respect for him and for the tradition of Firing Line. Um, what we do in Firing Line, I'm gonna show you a quick clip, quick clip, but it's something that is unlike anything else you'll find on, on television. And that's because we air for 26 minutes and 45 seconds every week without a single commercial, without any break. And in most cases, it's one guest um, and one uh, sort of deep dive into an issue, a topic, or, or a person um, against the backdrop of current events. And that's just something that you only get in podcasts these days. You really don't get it on television. And we are a privately funded program. And because we are privately funded, we are on public television. And, um, and we're, we're able to do it without commercials. So what I'd like to do is, if it's all right with you, um, just share with you a quick uh, highlight reel of the program so you get a sense of what we do. And then on the back end, I'll let um, Lieutenant Governor Greg ask some questions, and I will field your questions as well. Um, all right, let me just share this with you. Welcome back, Nikki Haley. Thank you. It's great to be here. Welcome back to Firing Line, General H.R. McMaster. Welcome to Firing Line, Secretary Condoleezza Rice. Margaret, it's great to be here. What an honor. President Trump is right. If you're going to do the old missions, because the Russians are still there, and you're going to do the new missions, everybody's going to have to pay their fair share. The Communist Party wants to stay in power in China. Xi Jinping is not a dictator. He's not a dictator? doesn't have a vote. He doesn't have a democracy. He doesn't, that he's doesn't not held mean accountable he can by voters. His... I'm looking at the people in Hong Come Kong. On. Do you believe now, even though we are out of the Iran deal, that it is still possible to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? Uh, it's not only possible, I think it's critical. Could we win a war with Iran? Yes. That didn't take you a second. Two strikes, the first strike and the last strike. If they launch missiles, there's very clearly going to be a significant response from the United States. And that would justify partners. a response from the United States. Oh, I think it would. How about the national debt? How about that national debt? How about that national yeah, that debt? 21 problem, billion gonna... dollars. Yeah. When you came to Washington, the debt was five trillion, and as you leave, it's 21 trillion. And there and you know are what the answer is? conservatives. Entitlements. Our debt is now 104% of GDP. Yeah. And OMB has projected that we'll have a trillion dollar deficit just this year. I don't think you'd defend that record. No. Is there a piece of the old Ted Cruz that might really stake a claim to helping push the party back to a position of fighting for fiscal discipline? Listen, I am fighting for that every day. Um, what we are doing with debt and deficits and spending is wrong and it's immoral. We're selling our kids and our grandkids down the river. So the Human Rights Council really was a place to do Israel bashing and for human rights abusers to hide. In fact, as you point out in your book, the Human Rights Council criticized Israel 10 times as much as it criticized countries like Iran. It did, yes. You've written that the rule of thumb is that anti-Semitism rises at times of great insecurity and upheaval. Yes. Um, we, have a, we have a perfect storm right now in this country. Is it your view that Israel has a right to exist as a nation? I have said many times that I feel everyone has a right to exist. I, I'm, I, I'm done talking about this. Okay. So you can move on. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. What did oh. you mean by that? 
Oh, um, I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements that are increasing in, in some of these areas. Do you think you can expand on that? I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. You seem to talk a lot about AOC. Well, she's a, she's a dynamic personality. Look, I don't like AOC's policies. I think they're way off base, okay? I, here's what I like. I like fighters. I want the Republican Party, I want this populist movement to start to have our own AOC. Whatever you want to say about the left, there are people like AOC that do a really good job of speaking to young people. And I think post-Trump America for the party is going to be a, a very, very dark place to rebuild. How is the conference chair of the Republican Party thinking about offering alternatives that are attractive to yeah. a rising generation? First of all, we have to make sure that people of all ages, but young people in particular, understand what it means. You know, when somebody says to you, the government is going to give you a job, guarantee it, what that means fundamentally is you're going to lose freedom. What went wrong and why did it go so wrong? According to the Inspector General, a lot of things went wrong in the conduct of the FISA applications. Most significantly, a lower level FBI lawyer fabricated something that went into one of the applications. But there were a host of other things too. There were a series of mistakes. Do you believe the Chairman Schiff has kept an open mind to this process? Of course not, he hasn't, right? The, 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 the articles in his report has already been written and that is what's going to ultimately get transmitted to, to, to judiciary. There are many in the media who go to a Republican woman in Congress and they say, how are you a Republican woman in the party of Donald Trump? How do you respond to that? Well, you know, I think that shows the bias in the media. Uh, I voted for President Trump in the 2016 elections. I am co-chairing his campaign in New York State. Uh, I support his policies. But most importantly, I vote my district, and the president understands that. A lot of the, the opposition I faced hasn't actually been within my own party. It's been, um, you know, political players on the other side who seek to take our seats out because we're the ones that destroyed the narrative that Republicans don't support women. I want to start by asking you, how do you think that New York City will be able to overcome this pandemic? New York City will overcome it, but in a different way than September 11 because this is a different kind of a, an attack. No one can tell you the perfect way to do this because no one's ever done this before. There is no manual for this. There's all, and, and, and embedded in this is our system of federalism, right? In my view, the way it works best is experts in epidemiology and public health provide us with information and they help policymakers set standards like what the White House has done. But ultimately those standards are implemented and enforced by local officials. Um, thanks. That was <laughs> so. So there's a, a sense of the program. Um, you got a sense of, of what we do, and you know, I'll just say a couple more things about the program. You know, Buckley hosted the original firing line, as I had mentioned, for 33 years, and he had about eight different formats. Um, he had formal debates, Oxford style, not Oxford style debates where you vote at the end, but but formal debates where there was a motion. Um, and, and two sides where people debated them. Those are some of the most iconic and memorable Buckley moments um, for Firing Line, but it was just one format. He also started exactly the way we've started, which is a one-on-one -on -one long form conversation. And he, uh, he wanted to debate because he had a background in debate. He had been in the Yale University's debate team, uh, and and he was a polemicist. He liked uh, he was a, and a contrarian by nature, and so he he liked to debate. But he found eventually that he wasn't effective as an interlocutor. He wasn't effective as a questioner or an interviewer and a debater at the same time. It was just a very difficult thing to do, uh, especially to be able to um, to really create a real contrast of ideas in the way he wanted to and in the way debate can get at. And so you'll find that about five or six years in, from time to time, he introduces a moderator who then becomes the person that moderates a debate about a certain question with uh, a guest. Um, and that, that he goes sort of back and forth depending on the kind of uh, program he wants to put forward, the kind of ideas he wants to explore. And uh, I'm 
excited to say that this is something that we're evolving towards. Um, and, and before the end of the third season, which we're in the, the, in the middle of our third season now, we will um, have some, some more contests of ideas that are more directed in, in a debate style format. Um, we're gonna evolve in the same, not in the same way that Buckley did, but we'll evolve uh, in that Buckley evolved, we also will evolve as, as any good program does in order to keep um, viewers challenged, engaged, and to grow viewers. Um, so I think with that, Adam, I would love to I just have a back and forth with you and then open it up eventually to um, our audience to be able to uh, answer any questions they have. I mean, this is, by the way, real behind the scenes here. Um, this is, this is, uh, this is the, the place where we shoot the program uh, in the, these days of COVID, of COVID-19. Um, I've been broadcasting from Long Island, uh, a little um, weekend cottage that was a weekend cottage that's become our full-time residence um, in, in during the pandemic. And so we started shooting from home and this is actually, you know, quite literally, I didn't really change the background. You can see my son, Jack Avalon's uh, beginning of a Lego Technic project right over here on the right, behind my right. Shoulder. I forgot to move that before I did this, but um, this is this is home. Um, so this is real behind the scenes. So have at it. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, thank you, Margaret. Appreciate that. Thanks for letting us behind the scenes with you, and looking forward to diving a little bit deeper here through through uh, Q and A. Um, first of all, I appreciate the presentation, and I just want to kind of remark on the fact that you know normally in our respective roles, we're on opposite sides of the firing line. So I, I must say I'm kind of looking forward to not being on the hot seat tonight and letting you enjoy that spot. And I bet some of your former guests feel the same way to actually see you answering questions this time because you don't let anybody off easy. And I think that's what a lot of viewers appreciate about you. Um, what, one of the things that comes to my mind anyway is, you know, obviously you've had a number of remarkable guests on your show. And uh, I think of President Hoover as somebody who had this show been around, he certainly would have been the kind of caliber guest that would come on to firing line. And that's probably true all throughout various points in his career, either as a business leader, uh, as somebody who went into public service, became the Secretary of Commerce, obviously during his time as president. And as you mentioned, he was also sort of an elder statesman in his post-presidency. So I'd be interested to know, you know, if you had the opportunity to bring President Hoover onto your show, what kind of questions would you ask? Both, maybe, maybe both as a great granddaughter, but then also, you know, maybe more in your professional role as well. Yeah, I, you know, I thank you for the question. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the easiest, you know, if there were anybody who you could anybody alive or at living or dead that you could have on the program, who would you have? And, and of course my answer is Herbert Hoover. Um, <clears throat> most of and I, you know, that used to be the question of anybody living or dead who you could have coffee with, I would always say Herbert Hoover. Um, and so that belies my passion for, for the man and his legacy. But, you know, look, he had such a long life as we know. I mean, 90 years, um, 50 of which, at least 50 of which uh, were, were directly in the public eye. And so, and he had these, you know, chapters, significant contributions in different phases of that public life. And I think of them in really four buckets, if you will. I think of them in the, in the context of his um, food relief and food administrative work, uh, beginning with the Committee for the Relief of Belgium in the uh, beginning of World War One, the, frankly, at the, at the outbreak of World War One, and, and, and then continuing on as food administrator under President Wilson um, his commerce secretary years, which were, you know, where he transformed the commerce department and where America's economy was transforming because it was in throughout the 1920s. Um, his presidency, of course, which was a, an enormously consequential presidency and time in American history. And then, and then his post-presidential years after 1940, when he realized that he, he wouldn't enter the public, the arena of electoral office again. Um, and, and so I think of those in four phases and they're, they're, it's a totally different line of inquiry, I think in each of those phases. Um, the, the food relief time is, um, you know, my, I think pet product, I would be very, very interested just in focusing on the individual initiative during the committee of the, the Commission for Relief of Belgium, the individual initiative. I mean, this is a man who was, was a private citizen and decided to take it upon himself <laughs> and take responsibility himself as a private citizen for feeding a nation. 
um, and 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 how uh, you know what kind of a, a, a person um, is is behind that kind of a, a consequential decision and initiative. Um, and of course, that one of the things that marked his abilities in that period is how efficient he was, how how excellent he was at operating and to enterprise that was able to create and you know solve this enormous problem that had never been solved before by in private hands so i just i think the real i'm personally quite interested in in just sort of the the nuts and bolts of how he made it work um his commerce secretary years i mean i could i could go on and on but i think those are the three areas and i would i would i would like to have president hoover not once but four times <laughs> and I, each in each of those times uh and, and focus on each of the sort of the consequential elements of of that storied part of his career because as commerce secretary he was transformative and as well as obviously during the presidency and in his um his post-presidential years when he was overseeing the two hoover commissions uh receiving honorary degrees around the world helping president truman put uh, food relief for Europe and the world back together after World War II. Um, so, so all of those um, periods, I think I would, um, I would be delighted to invite him to return at each phase of his public life. Well, I would definitely like to watch that if, if we ever had that opportunity. I think there's a lot of folks that are on tonight who would appreciate watching that as well. Um, I see that uh, some folks have found the Q&A portion there, so please do keep submitting your questions and, and we will uh, turn to those uh, in time here. Um, one of the things that I've had the opportunity to do in my role as Lieutenant Governor is visit visit the White House on a couple of different occasions. And, and it's kind of hard to not walk away in awe of the power and the history uh, surrounding that building and, and what it means. Now, you both have a personal connection because of the fact that uh, of your connection to President Hoover, but also because you worked uh, as part of the White House staff uh, for President George W. Bush. And so I'd be interested to, to know, you know, talk about what it felt like working there, knowing you had such a, a personal connection uh, to the building. Um, I mean, the White House is awe inspiring. It's <clears throat> It's the, the Capitol and the White House are, are two of them as to me, I mean, the temples of democracy. I mean, really the Capitol is the temple to democracy, but the White House is an extraordinary building because it's so rich with history. Uh, and uh, it was just, it was a huge honor to be able to work there, honestly. I mean, it's an honor to be able to visit the White House. It's an honor to be able to work in the White House. And it, truly, I mean, it was an, uh, you know one of the great honors of my lifetime to be able to work for President Bush um, and, and be in the White House and wander the halls. And I will give you, Adam, I mean, it, it, it was curious that um, there was only one other person at the White House when I was there who, who was related to a president. Uh, and, and that actually was President Bush. <laughs> uh, he worked at the White House and he was related to a former president. Um, but, you know, one of the things I was really imbued with growing up was, was this notion that, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm related to Herbert Hoover and that is this extraordinary curiosity of history. Right. Um, uh, I, di I didn't do anything to 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 earn it, um, but it but it's this sort of very interesting um, uh, fact. Right? I find it fascinating because I find him so fascinating. Um, but you know, it, it's also fair to say that not all of Herbert Hoover's descendants find it that interesting. Um, but it, you know, it, it was it was special to be able to think that you know my ancestors had a special relationship with that building, had lived there, um, had walked the halls. It's you know I. I you know, recognize some of the things that were in the White House, a, a portrait by um, Laszlo by, of my great grandmother, which is actually a copy that's uh, in the um, uh, the uh, Verme room, uh, which is on the first floor of the White House, because it's extraordinary. But um, beyond that, actually, it was very ordinary, like nobody thought about it. Nobody, nobody really, you know, like every generation gets to um, make this country anew. And um, so it was it, for me a little bit special, but really not not for anybody else and nor should it be. Well, very good. Well, you, you're right. It is kind of a interesting aspect of history and an interesting quirk. But I also think you've taken this on as a as a re responsibility as well with your service through the to the Hoover Presidential Foundation on the Board of Trustees and sort of being a, a, a guardian of, of Hoover's legacy and somebody who can very eloquently tell his story and share some of his experiences and just know that the folks who are on on this webinar definitely appreciate that aspect about you. 
Um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, you know, in Hoover's time, he was known as the master of emergencies, right? And everybody knows he dealt with economic crisis, but he also dealt with drought and flood and hunger, among other things, at various points in his career. And so I'd be interested to know what you think President Hoover's take might be on the United States' response to the pandemic that we're, that we're still dealing with and the attendant economic impacts that have come as well, whether that's been job loss, hunger, uh, et cetera. How, how do you think Hoover would analyze how, how we've done so far? Um, here's a, here, I'm not gonna second guess what Herbert Hoover would say about <clears throat> the current administration or the previous administration's uh, handling of the pandemic, but I think there are clues about uh, what he would have done and how he would have approached the pandemic. I think, and I think it's very fair to say, there's not clues. We have real evidence of how he handled emergencies when he was president uh, or when he was commerce secretary or when he was a private citizen. Uh, and one of the things as we alluded to, as we were discussing the, the commission for the relief of Belgium is that Hoover was an operational and organizational genius. He excelled at managing and running large organizations. He um, really, and the, the people who worked with him were imbued with a deep sense of loyalty to him. It, so much so his, his operation to feed Belgium, okay? Right, to feed an entire nation for the course of the war ended up with a surplus of millions of dollars that because because he had a surplus, because he was so effective at at operating and administering um, these hundreds of thousands of tons of food that had come from all over the world. I mean, to to feed 10 million people per day for the throughout the course of World War One and finish with an operational surplus is something that is just you know unheard of. I mean, it, it's truly unheard of. And uh, so so we know he would be very good at operationalizing um, any kind of care or directed need um, in the pandemic. Now, what comes to mind in particular to me is the uh, Mississippi River flood of 1927. And uh, in there, in that case, Hoover was Secretary of Commerce during that time. And Hoover had a very clear sense of what the role of the federal government should be in relation to the role of the states, municipalities, localities. And what Hoover believed is that the, the power of the federal government, he, he was a federalist in the sense that he believed it was up to the states and the municipalities and the cities and the counties to, to respond to the crisis. But he believed as, as a official of the federal government, he had a unique power to convene authorities in order to help coordinate relief and action and response. And so what he did as the Secretary of Commerce was physically go to the Mississippi River flood basin. Of course, you were able to, knowing that the floodwaters were coming, you could predict that a week out or six days out or five days out or three days out, you know, the floodwaters would rise to this level, um, this level plus X at this time. And so cities and towns had some degree of warning about how, to, how quickly they needed to evacuate. Um, and Hoover was able to uh, constitute tent cities up and down the Mississippi River flood um, basin. He would for, for tens of thousands of people. They people would evacuated their homes, moved into tent cities, and there he organized the administration of vaccines, right, and medicines for people um, so that so that they didn't uh, get typhoid fever or any of the um, accompanying sicknesses that come with flood, um, as well as as operationalizing the delivery of food. Um, to all of these tensities. So, so Hoover actually had done it. And I think the key, what we saw a lot in this pandemic was a, um, a lot of, dare I say, not infighting, but confusion amongst governors about who was gonna get PPE, how, who was gonna get um, vaccine, or well, forget the vaccine. Let's go, just go to the beginning of the pandemic. Who was gonna get PPE? Who was gonna get um, the, the materials needed? And you had governors fighting over who was gonna get what. And I, I think Hoover has demonstrated because of his leadership in the, in the Commerce Department that you know, th there, there is a role for a vigorous federal government that doesn't step on the states or tell them how to do things, but, but plays a, a leadership role and a convening role to, to help address uh, the most urgent sort of questions at the moment. And, and 
Um, that's one thing I think we didn't see a, a lot of in the context of the response to this pandemic. I, I think there were times where you saw the White House Coronavirus Task Force really taking the reins and, and trying to co communicate messaging, but it wasn't a consistent uh, presence and there wasn't real um, federal leadership helping to convene the governors and organize the governors um, as they tried to tackle the waves of virus at their states. So um, I, I know that Hoover would have approached uh, approached it quite differently, I think, um, than than the last administration did. And I, I just think it, that's clear uh, from his uh, from his from the history. All right. Well, let's turn a little bit more to your show. Uh, Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted all of our lives in a variety of different ways, and it's definitely impacted your show as well, both operationally and substantively. And uh, not surprisingly, it's become one of the dominant topics of your show over the course of the past year. Um, you've had the opportunity to interview lots of key players in the pandemic, whether that's Dr. Fauci, the CEO of Pfizer, obviously a number of political leaders who have been charged with navigating through the pandemic. Um, first of all, I guess I'd be interested, you know, how has your show adapted operationally? We see you're on set right now. It wasn't a set before this, but what, what other ways? Um, and then also, you know, what have you taken from your conversations with some of those uh, pandemic leaders? Um, yeah, so, I mean, yes, I, I broadcast now from my living room. Um, we've had a few uh, production uh improvements throughout the course of time. I, I, I regret that I'm not speaking to you from the more advanced webcam that I use when I'm broadcasting on television. Um, I have enhanced sound. Um, I've become the audio engineer, the camera engineer, the gaffer, the set designer, the hair and makeup person. The, the I mean, I, I, you know, there's, I, we've eliminated like six jobs. <laughs> um, and we have- well, you I, clearly, you clearly have better lighting than I do. I was just acknowledge that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we got we to get some work done in here. Well, um, you know, you, you got to be careful in historic, uh, historic capitals like the one you're in, where where the ceiling is being restored. Um, but so, look, it, it's um, we haven't lost six jobs, by the way. I don't want to. I don't want to make light of the pandemic. I mean, what's happened is we are out of a studio because it's not safe to be in the studio, and we'll go back to the studio when it's safe. Um, all the people who are employed by the studio are still employed by the studio. Um, so, so I just, I don't want to make light of, um, or anybody to perceive me making light of, of actually what these terrible times are and people who, who aren't able to go do the lights and the makeup and the hair and the, um, but uh, yeah, I've started doing a lot of it by myself. Uh, we're doing it here. All of my team works from home. I have a, a uh, we have a, a, an amazing team that helps me every week and there's seven of us. Uh, everybody's working from home. I truly, I don't know if we'll ever go back to the office. I think I'm going to require a mandatory happy hour once a week from here on out, just so we can see each other um, after it's safe to go back. But I, I don't know that we actually need to be in an office. We work really well the way we've been doing it. Um, uh, what were the other questions? What have I learned? Um, I've learned a lot. I mean, one of the, the program, because it's once a week and 30 minutes, requires an enormous amount of research. And so I have to know everything that Dr. Fauci said that week um, because, or, you know, Dr. Fauci was on, as you saw, um, Tom Frieden, Scott Gottlieb, Mike, Dr. Michael Osterholm. Um, these are all uh, faces and authorities uh, with real knowledge in epidemiology and infectious disease who have helped inform the public during this time. And so I have to know everything that they've said. And, and as the pandemic develops, um, there's there's new information. I can never just rely on what I knew from the last one because so much has changed. I mean, this is a, a moving target. Um, the virus is a, a, a moving target with its, you know, the, the latest, of course, is the variants that are now um, in the United States and the um, projected, even though our numbers are going down, which are is extraordinary, um, and they probably will continue to go down for the next couple of weeks. They, they, you know, it is predicted that with the variants, particularly the B117 variant that is from the United Kingdom, that numbers will, um, because it's 70% more contagious. Um, the things that we've done in the last year to stay safe uh, and and keep ourselves protected from the virus may not continue to work um, just because it's so contagious. So I, I, I have to study a ton um, and, and and read up and I've, I've learned an enormous amount about it. Um, I think my major takeaway is, you know, I, I've been as heartened and um, proud of, of this country as I've been disappointed. Um, we have 
you know, we just passed 500,000 Americans who have died of this disease. Um, and I think, you know, certain policy decisions had been made earlier uh, and been more clearly communicated to the country. I think some of those, many of those lives might have been saved if we had all started masking earlier. Um, I think that would have helped. Um, I think that's quite clear that would have helped. Uh, but I'm also very proud that, uh, you know, this country is the country that innovated the first two vaccines um, and, and the first series of vaccines, which are the, the thing that is going to sort of save us from this. And I think the key is the vaccine and that is enormously optimistic and it is because of um, the ingenuity and the, the research and development and, um, and the power of, of frankly the pharmaceutical companies um, that, that here, exist here in this country. Um, it was nowhere else that developed the vaccine. And, and that speed of science is extraordinary and is a real human achievement. Uh, and so that makes me enormously proud of our country. And um, it reminds me a bit of what Winston Churchill said uh, after in World War II, he said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all other options. <laughs> and so, you know, you have, you, have, you have good and bad and we try to focus on the good, but we, um, you know, we can't forget that, that this is, you know, it had been harrowing and there are 500,000 fewer Americans. And by the way, we're not finished with this. I mean, when you think in 1918 pandemic, 675,000 Americans lost their lives. Um, we're not, you know, we're not through the woods here. Um, and we are, you know, um, you know, that 500,000 is, is, is tragic. We've got a number of questions coming in and I had a few questions as well, um, kind of operationally about how do you, how do you prepare for your show? Um, so I'll just start taking a, a few of those. Um, one of those was, you know, who, I mean, there, I just started writing down from me, from your little highlight clip there of like, some of the amazing names that you've had on here, Condoleezza Rice, General Petraeus, General Mattis, numerous senators, Cruz, Cotton, Rubio, um, former governor and UN ambassador, Nikki Haley. You have, you've had AOC on there. You've had other, I mean, numerous figures. So one of the questions that came in is, you know, who haven't you had on that you'd like to have on in the future? And maybe we can use this as a platform to help you land them, I don't know. There's a Lieutenant Governor in Iowa that I'd love to get. <laughs> You're good. You're good. You should, you should go into politics. <laughs> um, uh, in all seriousness, we, we'd love to have you. Uh, and, <laughs> and in addition to you, um, look, there's a, a the, I will, I will tell you the very first guest we had um, ever, ever, ever for our very first program um, was Paul Ryan, who, when he was speaker of the house, and that was just um, incredibly exciting. And then our first uh, national episode, that was for an episode that aired only in New York. And for our nas first national episode was Governor Kasich, Kasich of Ohio. Um, you know, there's, there are a, a lot of, I mean, of course, you know, I'm very interested in politics and policy. Uh, and, and the guidance I have received from um, PBS is that as I, this is a new program, even, although it, it inherits the legacy of an old program because this is a new program and the audience doesn't know me yet, what I, what I really need to do in order to make the show successful is to have household names. <clears throat> people that, because we air in all 50 states, people that people in all 50 states are gonna know and recognize uh, and wanna tune in. Um, hopefully over time, they'll, they'll get to see the program, they'll get to know the program and they'll tune in just for the sake of the program, even if they've never heard of whoever the guest is. Uh, but, you know, so that's been the guidance. And so, you know, people, but not everybody has said yes. I mean, I go out to almost everybody. Um, there are very few people that I don't wanna have on the program. And, uh, you know, it's taken time to build the momentum, the esteem for, for people to trust me and trust what we do and, and trust that we're earnest and sincere. And regardless of whether I agree or disagree with any one of their positions, that they're going to get a fair hearing and it's going to be a, a, a rigorous but very respectful uh, exchange of ideas. The premise of the program is that civil discourse is a civic responsibility, that it is um, our responsibility as citizens to engage with the ideas in a way that's respectful and respectful of uh, the people who, who have those ideas. So uh, that's a long way of saying, um, I'd love to have Kamala Harris. I'd love to have Mike Pence. I'd love to have, you know, any one of the, um, frankly, cabinet secretaries from the Trump administration um, and, and the Biden administration coming in. Um, and then there's a lot of people that are not directly related to politics, but, but sort of meet this intersection of politics and, and policy um, and pop culture, right? And, um, Sean Penn, you know, is, is an actor that many people think 
um, especially on the right, I think think is, is enormously liberal and, and why would you want to have him? But actually Sean Penn has a lot of Herbert Hoover in him and, and bear with me. Uh, Sean Penn has all by himself started several nonprofit entities and has really, uh, what he's done in this pandemic is figure out a way just on his own to turn his nonprofit into an auxiliary unit that is helping the Los Angeles Fire Department vaccinate people all throughout Los Angeles. And he, you know, he was involved in Haiti. He was involved in the relief in, in New Orleans after the Katrina relief, but he's actually figured out how to scale um, a humanitarian operation, not, not to the size of, of feeding a country like Belgium, but He's really figured it out. And his model in Los Angeles has now been exported to several cities around the country where he's using, he's training volunteers. I'm sorry, it's not vaccinations, it's COVID tests. And this, this happened at the beginning of the pandemic, but he basically realized the fire department in Los Angeles was spending all their time trying to figure out how to test people and not responding to fires at the beginning of fire season. And so he figured if I can recruit enough volunteers and we can just teach you know, kids, young people, the healthy and those without comorbidities to do nasal swabs, then, then we can scale up our testing and, and help help the uh, authorities uh, fight the pandemic. And so he so he did. And, and I, I really respect this notion of individual citizens trying to hop in and solve problems and help their government and their community solve problems. This is, I mean, that's a, that's a very American thing and it's a very Hoover thing. And um, so whenever you can get, you know, a celebrity and, a, you know, a set of ideas and policy that hits the news at the right time, then, then yeah, that's sort of your sweet spot. Um, so I'm always looking for those. Well, I will admit that Sean Penn as Herbert Hoover was not a take I was expecting <laughs> to hear from you tonight, but very persuasive. Um, you know, one, one of the things that I'm interested in, in terms of your preparation for the show, and you've touched on it a little bit, is, you know, obviously, talk to a little bit about the extent of research that you've got to do to prepare for a 30 minute program with questions. I mean, I know the kind of research I did for to prepare for this. So I can only imagine when it's actually on broadcast TV, uh, the responsibility you feel to be prepared for that. But specifically, one of the things that I'm interested in is that that fact that you use all that old footage from mm -hmm. the William F. Buckley days of, of firing line. I think I wrote it down. I think you said 1,504 episodes. So how is it that you're able to track down from among 1,504 episodes that five second clip that captures the point that either you're trying to make or that helps provide context for the question that you're about to ask? Um, thank you for asking a question that uh, relates to one of the most joyful parts of the program and preparing the program for me um, because watching the old firing lines is is still riveting and um, basically what the Hoover Institution has done uh, is they have created a catalog online, a finding aid of all of the firing lines. And when they received the collection from Buckley, they put together and it's online. I can I can put the link actually in the um, chat so everybody can see it. But there's a, a finding aid that is comprehensive. It has all 1,505 shows, five programs uh, summarized in about a, a I would say 100 to 200, maybe in some cases, 300 word summary. Who the guests were, what the topic was, what the title of the program was, the date it was filmed on, and it's in chronological order. And it's just, it's, I mean, it's, it's just on one screen, literally. So I can click on that link, go to that screen, and then just start word searching if I want to word search. Or if, you know, I'm familiar enough with the canon, uh, with, with all the shows that Buckley had, the famous uh, individuals who were on. And, and truly, and, and an ode to Buckley, because he hosted this program for 33 years, the collection of Firing Lines is one of the most important collections of individuals who impacted the later half of the 20th century in American history. They were all on Buckley's show. Everyone from Mother Teresa to Muhammad Ali to Eldridge Cleaver to Groucho Marx to Billy Graham. Uh, I mean, and, and the whole gamut, you know, everybody who ran for president, everybody who ran for vice president. Um, senators, I mean, multiple, <laughs> Nixon, I mean, it's, everybody was on there. And uh, so I often have a sense, oh, I, Yo-Yo Ma, for example, we just filmed the uh, 
celebrity cellist Yo-Yo Ma um, last week, and it will air in a few weeks. Uh, and I knew that Buckley had had a couple of outstanding um, concert pianists. Rosalind Turek was one of them. And so we, you know, I went and you Google, you know, you just word search Turek. Uh, and I, you know, found her episodes and, and looked at um, what we, we ended up not using hers. Uh, we ended up using another question he had. He, Buckley, of course, was an amateur harpsichord player. And so I, we had a, a separate clip about amateur musicians and why people in the United States seem to stop playing when they reach adulthood if they're not um, going to achieve the heights of professionalism that Rosalind Turek or Yo-Yo Ma in this case achieved. And so that's the clip we used. But basically I, I look for themes from the program's questions as I've, as I've researched the program, which takes the whole week. I mean, as soon as I finish one program, I'm barely done editing it before I've dived into the next one. I read the books of the, of the people who are coming on. I read all their recent opinion editorials. I read all the criticisms in the press of them. Um, you know, you have to, you know, and all of, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I'm a working mom. And so it actually works really well when I'm in the car to continue researching by listening to podcasts. Um, and uh, I'm watch all their recent television programs and interviews and just take in the whole universe of information. And then as the themes develop, I think I'm thinking through that Buckley catalog of, you know, what are some of the resonant themes in, in that I can ask this person that Buckley also dealt with or touched on. Um, and basically with a 33 year library, there's always something that Buckley did that relates to a series of questions or a line of inquiry I have for my guest. So I, I mostly find it, but I have a I have I have a team of people who who help me. Why well, I, I think one of the things that certainly I appreciate about your show, and I think it, it's true of others on here too, is it is one of the few areas on TV anymore, maybe anywhere, where you can find true civil discourse and sort of a full conversation beyond just the you know just just a, a little clip of something. You've got a whole conversation with these newsmakers and, and leaders, and, and it's pretty remarkable. So one of the questions from, from Jan Myers in the audience kind of touches on the fact that we tend to be in echo chambers anymore and that uh, firing line is the exception anymore rather than the rule. So her, her question was this, do you ever fear or consider that drawing upon only like-minded views may shape, distort, or slant reality, a reality that might actually be wrong? Um, so. I actually, I mean, the whole point of the program is to engage with views from a range of perspectives. And so I don't, um, I mean, I think that's the premise of the program, actually. And by the way, that's not my idea. That's Buckley's idea, right? I mean, that is the, the etymology, that is the DNA of the program, is to engage with a wide range of ideas in a way that is rigorous and intellectually honest and enlightening for the audience. Um, my approach and my take, my, I think my, the, the, the way I go about it is, is slightly different, um, certainly different than cable news these days, the, the sort of split scream of the you know, small clip and the he said, she said. Uh, I come, come from a place of real, an interest in real inquiry. I, I really wanna understand who the person is, why they think what they think, and then challenge them if I, if I you know, Think that there's something that I'd like to understand a little better, um, and and I think you know you can do that fundamentally by respecting the people that you're engaging with, even if you don't agree with the conclusions they've drawn. And I think that's just you know our responsibility, I think as citizens, is to um, respect one another, but engage rigorously with the ideas in order to try to forge the best path forward for um, for for our country. I mean, I, I fundamentally believe in this. You know, the, the quip of Benjamin Franklin coming out of um, Constitution Hall when the person said, you know, sir, what is it? Uh, uh, what kind of government have you have you come up with? And he says, a republic, if you can keep it. Um, I, I fundamentally believe that it is up to every generation to keep it, um, to maintain uh, the pillars of freedom. And I think in our generation, specifically, this notion of actually reaching out and listening to other people and hearing other people and engaging in ideas uh, is is fundamental to the maintenance of our democracy. Um, and so that's the real premise of the program, which by the way, was Buckley's idea too. Outstanding. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. I wanna squeeze in 
two questions, which probably goes against that entire premise, right? Not to have just little sound bites, no, but instead we can, to dive no, in. No, 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 but it's not. No, this is a real. We're doing it here. Um, it's a real. Back okay. Back. Okay. Also, we so, have uh, the next question from the audience is, you know, what would you most like Iowa high school students to know about President Hoover's lasting contribution to our nation's history? Okay, yeah, that's not fair because that's that's a thirty-minute tribute. <laughs> um, no, what I, well, Iowa high school students? This is what I want all Iowans to know, but particularly the high school students. <clears throat> um, Iowa high school students probably have a better, a, a, a fairer and more balanced uh, take on Herbert Hoover than most high school students. Um, and just because I think, you know, if you've gone through the Iowa public school system, you've been through Iowa, you, you, you're around, you've maybe had a chance to go to the presidential library if you haven't, go! Um, and, but, you know, you've, you have probably from your environment gleaned that there's this other story about Hoover that the mainstream historical narrative hasn't fully captured. Uh, I think what's most important to understand about Hoover is in a 90 year life, a 50 year public service, life in public service, directly in the public eye, he was oriented entirely around service. Um, and that came directly from his Quaker roots, that came directly from Iowa. And that that, that led him um, through his life, it, it caused him to create and innovate the model for large scale humanitarian food relief which is you know, what catapulted him onto the world stage, but that this man from Iowa who was orphaned at the age of nine and had came from very little means, was able to, you know, through, through the opportunities the country afforded him and through hard work, um, pioneer the first large scale humanitarian food relief operation that ends up becoming a, a basis for UNICEF um, and, and every nonprofit uh, food relief organization in the world. I mean, Herbert Hoover innovated that. Um, and and that, that that degree of service and caring for others came directly from Iowa. Um, and it's a legacy that Iowans should feel very, very proud of. Um, and that as, uh, I, and I know we're up on our, our time, Adam, but I, I'll just say, you know, also keep in mind that there is a very long and unsettled history about Hoover's presidency. Um, and I think really to, to tackle the Hoover legacy, we have to tackle the gorilla in the room, the 800 pound gorilla, right? Which is, which is Hoover's presidency and the Great Depression. And it, it is very much my view that um, the history is not settled around uh, the choices that Hoover had to make, the choices he did make, um, what we knew about modern macroeconomics at the time, which was essentially nothing compared to what we know now. Um, and that Hoover has not yet been judged by history in the context of what, what was known by his contemporaries. He is judged against what we have learned about modern macroeconomics since then. Um, but he is not judged by what by the tools that were available to him at the time. And I think that a real review of his presidency um, over time will reveal um, and uh, that, that Hoover um, cared enormously about the American people, uh, worked tirelessly throughout the course of his presidency and, um, and, and made some good decisions and some, some decisions that were not the right decision, but that he, he did it absolutely with a servant's heart and with the best interests of the American people in mind. Um, and, and that I think over time, history will, will be more kind um, and more fair frankly, in their, in their assessment of his presidency. Um, and, then, and then there's all the other stuff. So there's so much to know about Hoover. I mean, what, if you could, I could inspire anyone. I mean, there is so much work to be done in the context of reevaluating his legacy. And it is, uh, uh, there is just a treasure trove of material that's available to a new generation of historians to be able to just pick up and tackle and documentarians, frankly. Um, not just historians, documentary filmmakers, um, and creative types. So there's there's so much to do with Hoover. He's enormously inspiring, and frankly, not having him um, as 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 understood as he really ought to be has has been to our misfortune. And so I I'm I'm so grateful to you, Adam, and many others who are working to help restore his legacy. Well, it, I mean, it is a truly amazing and inspiring story, which definitely deserves to be better told. And I think that's a perfect segue into the last question from the audience. This one comes from Rod Lennertz, who is a member of the uh, Board of Trustees of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. 
Um, and, and he just asked for you to speak for a moment about the vision for modernizing the Hoover Library and the support that's needed from Iowans and from American citizens to support that. I, Rod, thanks so much for the for the question, and thank you for your interest um, and the dedication and devotion and leadership that you've been you've been part of this. I mean, um, what uh, maybe many of you who don't know who are on this is that um, between Lieutenant Governor Greg and and Rod and many others who are also on this um, call is you know our library, Presidential Library um, Museum and Library is was last refinished its permanent exhibits in 1992 when Ronald Reagan came to rededicate the library. Uh, of course, Herbert Hoover and Harry Truman dedicated the first library. Uh, Ronald Reagan came and rededicated the permanent exhibits, but, but most libraries, presidential libraries and museums, the Reagan Library, for example, after they uh, unveiled uh, their, their museum and library, <clears throat> remodeled after 12 years or perhaps it was eight years, somewhere between eight and 12 years. Most libraries renovate their permanent exhibits every 10 years. Um, so our library, which tells an incredibly refreshing and wonderful story about Herbert Hoover, everybody who comes leaves learning something and feeling so elated and heartened by the legacy of Herbert Hoover. But what we'd like to do is modernize and update it so we can tell these stories to a new generation using new technologies um, and, and in a modern way. I think much of the history of what, what's been understood about Hoover has changed in 30 years, it's developed. Um, I, I think the way we look at the Great Depression and the way we look at the economics of that time period has evolved. But we also know that we can, using the archival repository we have at the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum, we have, we have many, many archival um, uh, uh, artifacts we can tell the story in an updated way that will bring new um, new audiences to Herbert Hoover's legacy, um, and we can renovate it and give it sort of the much needed facelift um, that it has had. And so we are underway. Uh, we are in a process of um, doing just that. And with uh, the help of you, Lieutenant Governor, and Rod, and, and many others um, on the Hoover Presidential Foundation Board, led by our fearless leader, Jerry Flagel, um, we hope to be telling you more about it soon. Uh, so stay tuned on that because um, there is a, a, a very exciting new chapter ahead for the presidential Hoover Presidential Foundation and the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. Margaret Hoover, thank you for taking us behind the scenes of Firing Line. Very interesting and engaging as always. We truly appreciate you. We appreciate your show. We appreciate all that you do to support the Hoover Presidential Foundation. So thank you for joining us here tonight. And just a reminder for uh, everybody, make sure you check out hooverpresidentialfoundation.org so that you can find our great up upcoming programming uh, here over the course of the next month. So thank you all for joining tonight. We'll see you soon. Thank you.